but it was in You're listening to Politics Within Reason, the official podcast of the Party of Reason and Progress. Show the world you care about progress. Go ahead, give us a like or a share. And if you want to learn more or support your purpose, visit partyofreasonandprogress.org. Welcome to Politics Within Reason. I'm your host, Holly Griffith. With me is Michael Hamm, and we have a very special guest tonight, Jerry DeWitt. Jerry is a former pastor turned atheist from South from Southwest Louisiana, my neck of the woods. He deconverted to atheism in 2011 and joined the Clergy Project, a group with which lends confidential support to preachers who no longer believe in God. In 2013, Jerry wrote about his experiences in an excellent book entitled Hope After Faith, which I highly recommend the Audible version of because Jerry himself reads it and makes it all the more personal. His story is fascinating, and we're lucky to have him on the pod today. Jerry, thanks for joining us. Totally my pleasure. Thank y'all for having me, and thank you for listening to the audiobook. I loved it. I was I was hooked from page one. <laughs> <laughs> well, from I appreciate that. How long did it take to record the audiobook, if you don't mind my it asking? Took, um, we had 33 hours of recorded time, and I think that uh, that was edited down to about 11 hours. Wow. Yeah, and, and that was totally just because um, I was in uh, David Smalley's studio, and David and I have a really, really great time when we're together. And so I went out of my way to repronounce every word, to um, try every sentence, and obviously in at least three different ways, while David was busy doing other things. And, and once once we saw that we had 33 hours <laughs> of time to edit... He said, man, I wish I would have sat in there and directed you. <laughs> As a side note, the, the, the podcast recording might go for 33 hours, but we will trim it down for everyone else. So we'll trim it down, If we, if we down, really yes. get on a roll here. Okay. Well, I got in New Orleans at about 2 o'clock this morning, so normally I could make it 33 hours, but it may, it may only be about 23 this time. <laughs> so, Jerry, so just some of your history. So you were a Pentecostal pastor, is that right? That's correct. Of and two churches, was, right? Yeah, and that was that was for um, a fair portion of my ministerial experience. Um, over the, you know, through the years of my Christian experience and Christian ministry, I became um, a little more progressive, a little more liberal, as much as a fundamentalist can be liberal in so for southwest people, Louisiana. <laughs> right. I was going to say, for people who don't understand, so first of all, southwest Louisiana is kind of strange I would, in terms of religion. It's kind of this weird mix of, of Catholics, of Protestants, and of evangelicals. Yeah. And because uh, I was, I'm so for so Jerry and I, if you're you being from DeRitter, I'm from Lake Charles, we're from about 45 minutes apart from each other. Right. Um, I was Catholic. We thought y'all were very strange. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> and we thought y'all weren't even Christians. Uh, yeah. Uh, right. I, know, I was evangelical you know, and all y'all were heretics. Crazy idol worshippers. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but, but Pentecostals, we, what I thought was weird, especially being a woman, was the, the women with the long hair and the skirts, right? They couldn't cut their hair they couldn't wear pants right and and interestingly enough you 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 couldn't cut it with scissors but if you were very very clever you could burn the ends off with a curling iron and probably still make it to heaven so so there there were tricks to the trade oh my gosh okay i didn't know that whenever i convert now i know that's right now you know Um, helpful hint number one from the podcast tonight yeah, that's exactly right. It, you're, but you're describing it right. I, you know, I always used to say we were we were kind of like Amish, but with two tone trucks. You know, um, it, it's um, it's a very distinctive look, and sometimes now because there's so much press about Amish people, uh, some sometimes people even learn a little bit about Mennonites and 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 Pentecostals old school, as we used to call them, clothesline Pentecostals, um, they they could be mistaken, you know, for for someone of that of that persuasion, um, and it and it really traces its origins right back to um, really the 1940s, 1950s, whenever the United Pentecostal Organization was forming, and a very conservative theology just said this far, you know, this is as far as we're going, and so when you look 
look at people that that come from a um, an older old school version of Pentecostalism, it'll stand out to you, and I'd be like, oh yeah, that's that's how a lot of people looked in the forties and fifties. You know, what made this interesting to me, you know, we're doing a politics podcast, obviously, and one of the religion is obviously one of those things that people really identify with, right? It becomes a part of your identity. And it's so hard for people to examine that, right? And politics is, has become the same way. It's very tribal and it's a really ingrained part of your identity. And it can be really hard to reach through to people. And I guess I'd be curious to know, like, during your, your journey, were, were there things that really stuck out to you? Was there any one moment that just made you think, huh, that's really fascinating and changes my view? Or was it just a, you know, a, um, an entire journey? <clears throat> Well, there there were there were several, you know, through the course of 25 years. Um, I probably would never be able to remember them all. I tried to put as many as I could in the book. Um, some I left out for the sake of people's um, privacy, but I, I can I can think of one that is somewhat of a nexus between both uh, the religious landscape and the political landscape. Had some friends who had a loved one that was caught as um, as being gay. You know, it was it was a big secret. You know, real. real Real big mm-hmm. secret, and this is now thirty plus years ago. So it yeah. was a really big secret. Very yeah. different time. time period. Yeah, very very different time. And um and and it shook this family to the core. They had been uh, very conservative politically and um, somewhat conservative religiously. The parents more than the children, and it was one of the parents that uh, was discovered to be gay. Oh, wow. oh, and wow. uh, yeah, it, it so it was a big deal. It was a big deal. And I had I had just begin to get in interested in the ministry so maybe yeah so it was still close to 30 years ago and um and so we're dealing with this you know and in pentecostalism um and and it was true with my conservative republican politics at the time um homosexuality was a choice you know that was right that was the go-to for explaining these kind of things and so I remember sitting um, on the floor. I was a young man, so it was easier to get up, you know, off the floor. But I, I remember sitting on the floor, uh, almost at the feet of of one of my friends, um, and we're discussing this. We're we're discussing how this works, and I'm I'm regurgitating the party line, both the religious and the political party line, about it. You know. But I'm, but I'm being compassionate about it because yeah. I always was very compassionate, very understanding with these kind of things, and and so I, you know, I say, well, you know, it's a choice, and I remember this guy sitting there, and he was like, um, he was nodding his head, you know, affirmingly, very, kind of looking off and up to the left, you know, like he's pondering what I'm saying, like he's, you know, like hmm, maybe this this dude's got a point. I don't realize that he's fishing me in, you know, with. <laughs> <laughs> with, his, with his soft uh, features, and and he goes, yeah. He says, I, he says, I can see that. He says, uh, he says, okay. So so, uh, tell me, tell me about um, when you chose to be a heterosexual. <laughs> wow. And That's... on the inside, you know, my inner Scooby Doo, you know, <laughs> came out. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> and and it was done right then. In that, as as soon as he finished his sentence, my politics changed instantly. Huh. Wow! And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> okay, I, I get it. You know, you get I, it now. I, yeah, I, wow. I get, I get it. You know, and um, and 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 that played a role even that far back in in changing uh, my ideas about some things religiously. Even though I wasn't, I was in the fundamentalist circles, I, I wasn't a hardcore evangelical the way that we normally think of them. So so even though if I had to write it down on paper, my doctrine would have been, you know, anti-choice, you know, or anti, right. uh, not choice, but anti, anti, you know, alternative or whatever the case may be. But, um, but I didn't live that way, you know. I, mm. I, I was a loving person, but in that one, in that one sentence, he was able to align my heart with my theology instantly. Mm. Wow! Yeah. Wow! Yeah, that, so, that's pretty fascinating, and I think we're going to be seeing a lot of that, you know, with people kind of grappling with how far do I go to support somebody who. You know, I mostly agreed with, but there's just so many little uh, pinpricks every day, right, of, you know, is that really 
what I support. And it's not likely that it, it's rare that any one thing matters, but it, it just it kind of builds up. Right. It does. Well, and, and, it, and that's what everyone says is it, it takes, you know, all, all it takes oftentimes is for you to know someone who's who's gay. I yeah. mean, now it's common because people feel feel more comfortable coming out. Sure. But back then when people didn't, you know, once you did know someone who, who was gay and you could see that they are human and they're just like you yeah. and, you know, he asked you that question. Well, then you could identify with him and it makes you rethink things. Yeah. This was Harvey Milk's kind of genius insight was you had to come right. out even though you were going to be hated initially. Right. The initial people right. would be very hated. And right. You know, some other, you know, the other groups in society that are stigmatized that way now are kind of atheists, right? You see that sure. after the Texas shooting, uh, people are trying oh, to yes. smear the guy as an atheist immediately, right? You know, they, right. Yeah. they're looking say, for something. <laughs> yeah, they're looking yeah. for something. And <laughs> he's it didn't not matter Muslim, was, so he's got to be. It's got to be an atheist, yeah. Else, yeah. yeah. Or an atheist yeah. Muslim, if you had seen some of the <laughs> right. ridiculous right, things right. out there. That, yeah. That would be well, even better. I, yeah, I think this is I, I I think this is a good example and a um, a teaching moment uh, for all of us going forward. I think we need to be very careful in um, combining uh, what hopefully are always separate issues into one argument. Um, we're not enjoying the fact that he had, as as the media phrases it, preached atheism, you know, on his on his Facebook page or whatever. Yeah. We're, we. You know, we would we really wish that he would not have done that. Of course, we more so wish that he would have gotten the help that he obviously needed at some point, and that these twenty six people were still alive and yeah. you know joined their week with the rest of us. You know, obviously that's the most important part is that people people lost their lives, and regardless of the reason or regardless of the background, that's that's the heart of the matter. So I I think going forward uh, we we would probably be wise to not bring religion into these tragedies. Yeah, that's right. Um, any yeah. any more than we absolutely have to. You know, if the if the person was was preaching Christianity on their Facebook page and then kills twenty six people, it probably wouldn't be very wise of us to make an issue of that going forward. Yeah. No, but I don't think we would. <laughs> you know? I, don't, I think the only time that you should do that is if your religion does explicitly say go kill people exactly and well, exactly. that's what you do exactly. well, and, and, <laughs> and that's what you preach like, of it yeah and, it, and it's like uh my son paul he and i were talking about this subject earlier today and he said well you know obviously if you know somebody walks into a crowd of people and yells you know ali akbar and and then blows themselves up it, it, you can probably say there's a religious motivation somewhere behind this you know yeah it's, um, it's tied for sure right yeah there, there there there's clearer indications but in general yeah i think if we can put things um if we can humanize every single situation and and, and here's the deal all right now you got me on my soapbox i apologize <laughs> I can feel uh, the here that's why go. you're here that's why you're here uh, <laughs> i feel it coming on <laughs> um, you know it, it, here's the thing that infuriates me about all of this and i had someone i had someone ask me you know why why do you beat up on the secular movement all the time you know and that was reminiscent to now what feels like a hundred years ago preaching in a pentecostal church uh, a pentecostal lady came up to me after service one night i was filling in for brother ray miller near chattanooga tennessee and and she said are are you pentecostal and i was like well yeah and she says well why are you always talking about bad things that pentecostals do you never mentioned a baptist or the methodist or anybody else and i said well you know i looked out over the congregation and i didn't see any baptist or methodist <laughs> so i didn't feel like point, right. you know and so so i beat up on the secular movement a lot because that's the people that's listening and that's the people that's the movement that i want to try to help you know yeah, in it's some a way. police your own you type can affect. Police your own yeah exactly and so i i i get very um i get very disappointed when i see even people in the secular movement um engaging in what i consider to be a religious practice which is to not put forth the intellectual and emotional energy to investigate and appreciate the nuances of every single situation individually. 
and and that's hard and it's tough and we're yeah. trying you know trying mm-hmm. to make a living and we're trying to get the baby <laughs> to sleep and we got yeah. you know a, a tire to get changed and I mean we we got busy lives and so so we can't become experts in every single thing all the time right but if there is a subject that we're really you know spouting off about on a regular basis then that's probably one that we need to try to understand the nuances yeah of. really in- investigate right. some uh, energy into understanding it yeah yeah. But uh, The Onion famously had a headline at one point that said, stereotypes save us time, right? And uh, that's <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> sort of true. You know, I mean, I, I know it's, you know, I know it's satirical, but 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 it's true. It, it, it really yeah. is true. And and we we obviously need those things. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, the, the great analogy is 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 not having to relearn a doorknob every time that <laughs> yeah. you, you know, get right, next to right. one. But, you but know, then at I'm, that point, it's like we're no better than Fox News in a way. And we don't want to be. <laughs> You know, we don't want to go down that path. That's right. That's exactly right. I mean, you know, we could we we, we could very quickly say, um, you know, uh, yes, this is horrendous. And the real tragedy are the lives that are lost. But don't connect atheism to that. Okay, well, no, by definition, don't connect atheism to that. But do we know this guy? You know, do do we know that his the atheism within his mind didn't have some kind of effect? Well, no, we we don't necessarily know that, at least not yet. Maybe maybe somehow we will uh, or maybe some people do know and I don't. But I, I think I think we we just take it too easy on subjects. Sometimes we just take it too easy. Yeah, yeah. We, we want the easy answer, Good right? Point. And we don't want the easy answer. We want the fast answer, and the we fast want the answer, answer yeah. that How's works that? for us. Right, the one you that know? fits my personal biases and makes me right. be able to move Maybe, on with yeah. my day. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And we have to do that. I mean, I'm not saying that, you, that, you, that, we, that we should not ever do that. We have to do it. We don't have enough time and energy to, to do otherwise all the time. So can but, I bring um, up something that, so, that is, sure. I think, really related to this, is that in the social media age, we are just, you know, hammered with story after story. And... Some of these stories are really hard to tell from truth, and that's only going to get worse. You know, Adobe has this amazing product out now that you can just insert people into video. You can make it sound like their voice is saying something they didn't. And so at some point, there's going to be even maybe more of a belief system in what is true and what is not, right? You know, Mm -hmm. that's going to be a tough balance. You're going to have to actually uh, not trust your eyes and ears on some things because you can't know and so there will be a bit of a belief system behind it and you know how do you how do you balance that kind of thing right how do you balance like belief of what i want what i will trust you know yeah. with these things you see <laughs> well the the first thing i would have to say is have we ever been here before you know and obviously not technical you know technologically here before but have we ever been in a situation similar to this and and i and i i think we have um in different ways you know there 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 was a time that a a the publication of a newspaper of a newsletter you know early early in in um our literary history it, it took uh, a good bit of finance to be able to do that. It took no. a, a a fair amount of education to do that, and so so it was a little more reasonable to trust. Um, what was being said just because of who was putting forth the information. Then then as uh, publication becomes easier, less expensive, and more prevalent, then you, you do hit uh, this saturation point where everybody's doing it and, and you don't know what to read, what not to read. Yeah. And over time, um, over time, some trusted, whether they should be or not, but some <laughs> trusted arbitrators, some trusted uh, referees of information – seem to you know float to the surface and 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 we had that for a little while in 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 even in broadcast news yeah that's a good point. you know you mm-hmm. could you you could get news from all kinds of sources but if NBC CBS ABC said it right then they had they had skin in the game you know so mm-hmm. there was there was something really to it then and so it kind of pulled us out of that uh, out of that place of well who can you trust what can happen now then even that type of technology becomes less expensive and and easier <laughs> to duplicate <laughs> and and you end up where we're at now that well you know god it, you know CNN keeps making mistakes you know Fox News obviously you know whatever mm-hmm. um, but i do think 
that eventually there is some level of authority that 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 rises up to the top. Hopefully, that will be the case with you know the way the the way the technology allows you to just completely fabricate a very uh, very <laughs> realistic, full sounding, yeah, very realistic story. I yeah. hope that becomes case. Maybe maybe there'll be some type of signatures, you know, that that um, the technology will will create that. You know, you'll have to almost put a thumbprint on it or something of verification. You know, yeah, that's I don't actually, know. That's actually that's actually an interesting. Yeah, point. that's interesting. Yeah. But that could be fake too. Maybe I don't it know. Eventually, it yeah, eventually at yeah. all. You know, every every safeguard that you that you get eventually. Yeah. Well, I remember whenever I was working at City Hall many years ago, um, that type of position. So I love politics, and we can talk about politics all that you want. Because um, I was going to run for mayor. Matter of fact, I should be mayor. Just um, when's the next political season come? I don't remember. Uh, maybe into next year w- would have been my term, but um, I had the privilege of, of talking to some authoritative people out of Fort Polk, and and one person was oh, so. Old, yeah. Should, should we explain That's, Fort Polk? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so so Fort Polk is in Leesville, which is about twenty minutes north of Deritter. And it's a, an army base. And so so DeRitter is in a – so in Louisiana, we have parishes. We don't have counties, but they're essentially counties. And uh, DeRitter is in a dry parish, so no alcohol. And so Leesville, where Fort, Fort Polk is, they can sell alcohol. So people from DeRitter go to Leesville a lot, I guess, too. <laughs> to right. buy alcohol. But that's where the army base is. <clears throat> and so right. it's – they have – they have – Things there that DeRitter necessarily doesn't really have, but anyway. <laughs> right. and and it's uh, it's the joint the readiness, like. yeah, a joint <laughs> readiness um, uh, facility, and and so it's 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 huge, and there's a lot to it, and and I'll I'll, I'll tell you one little caveat here in just a moment, but don't let me forget about dry and wet parishes, but. The um, but this this person who was over security, you know, he said he said security is nothing more than layers of inconvenience. <laughs> yeah. That's all. Security is nothing more than layers of inconvenience. <laughs> you know, you can put up you can put up a um, you know you can put up a four foot tall um, white picket fence. And that literally will be inconvenient enough for some people not to cross over and steal your lawnmower. You yeah. know. But but somebody, somebody somewhere, if they want to, will go through that, you know. And you can put up a a ten foot tall chain link barbed wire topped fence, and that's going to stop the majority of people. But somebody somewhere will suffer through that inconvenience and go through that as well. And so, if it was a signature thumbprint or whatever it might be, it's yeah. always about layers of inconvenience. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. So so you can actually yeah. buy alcohol in Ritter now. You can. Yeah, has been that way for years. Oh, yep. No, wow, wow, I've been going. <laughs> yeah, for they too discovered long. They, 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 a quick a quick little side note. They they someone pushed the issue and wanted to sell alcohol into Ritter, and the mayor at that time, um, Mayor Johnson, reached out to the state attorney's general's office to get a clarification of opinion on it because for decades and decades and decades we were dry, mm-hmm. and um, the attorney general's office came back and said, "What made you ever think you were dry? You've never been dry." <laughs> and, oh um, my God! And the power, and the power of belief. Yeah, it was just a uh, a story had huh. had you know had created a mythology. There was supposedly a soldier that was drunk, um, that walked up onto the wrong porch downtown Jeritter, trying to find his girlfriend, and um, somebody stepped out and shot him, hmm. and bam, you know now wow. Jeritter's dry. That's kind of the mythology behind it. I don't oh, know if there's any truth to any of that. Yeah, and so uh, so suddenly then there was a rush. For the city council of DeRitter in particular, and then later on the parish to uh, put um, restrictions in place. Uh, they couldn't keep alcohol out, but they were able to keep out bars, strip clubs, yeah. things like that. Yeah, that all the things that Leesville. <laughs> all the <laughs> things Polk that was. you drive to Leesville for, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> now, so, what's fascinating about this is is that the DWIs immediately went down because they people did. were. Yeah, because no people were no longer having to drive to pick up their alcohol and drive back. They could oh, pick oh, it up. Oh, okay, I thought you meant okay. Whenever they went dry, because I was going to say I got into a car accident in Deritter whenever it was technically dry, and the guy right. who hit me was drunk. Yeah, exactly. But now that they can uh, pick up, you know, pick up their beer while they're in Walmart, you know, right. getting their milk. <laughs> 
they have the patience apparently to get home. Oh, you know, before they start drinking. Aww, the like only the only up. thing was the the churches were complaining that there was uh, there was there was you know. Um, alcohol uh, debris you know in the oh, ditches God. now and, and they'd never had to tolerate that shameful you know sight mm. before oh, they had to see it yeah but bringing in bringing in thousands and thousands of dollars of revenue every month yeah yeah i'm sure it is yeah that's what I'm makes sure marijuana legalization really attractive to states is the uh, the extra sure. money that goes with yeah. it and uh you know so it's, yeah, it's an interesting it, time. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a very interesting time. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, ancient Chinese curse, right? I mean, we live in yeah, an interesting exactly. time. That's right. So, Jerry, so when you can, when you deconverted, I guess, uh, so what, um, how was that process for you? I mean, I, I know what it's like in, in DeRitter. I mean, I know what it's like in Lake Charles. I can't imagine in DeRitter. I, I, obviously, I read the book, but with your family, with your friends, I, I, your job, I mean, how how was that just day to day life in in a, you know, a dry parish where there's tons of churches? I mean, Deritter, there's just churches on every block. They're everywhere. You can't swing a cat without hitting a church. It um, was, um, you know, uh, it, it, it was my first time to experience um, a very challenging, um, uh, challenging position within any community. Last last night, I was in uh, New Orleans with uh, <laughs> Yoan Yuri, which is the author of uh, Chasing the Screen, and it's a fantastic book. I recommend everybody getting it and reading it. It's it's just a total different take on addiction. It's great, and so I, I spent I don't know maybe four or six hours. He's writing a new book uh, about change, and so he asked me to meet him over in New Orleans and we sat all evening and we talked about change and the reason I'm, I'm saying that is that he pulled out uh, some of these experiences out of me last night which is kind of the first time that I've I've, I've relived them in, in a while you know for the first couple of years of being in the secular movement and touring particularly with the book I was telling these stories regularly and and then you know my role within the movement kind of took on um, you know some different responsibilities and so it's it's fresh while we're while we're you know on the show because of bringing it all up last night and what I remember distinctly was um, Outside of being uh, shorter than average, um, which, you know, made me feel a little bit apart, when I came out as an atheist, it was the first time I experienced a glimpse of what it would be like to be a minority. Well, so you didn't really come out on your own, right? There was a photo Right. That was circulated of you. Right. That, so that, that started so- that started the process and I had to then for a lack of better words, I had to confirm or deny. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I confirmed. Um yeah, I I had, my son and I had slipped off to Houston, Texas for the Free Thought Convention in 2011, October 2011. I had learned about it through my connections with the Clergy Project. It was all very secretive. Um, felt comfortable going to Houston and attending an atheist meeting because I didn't think I would run into too many, you know, Christians from Deritter you know, <laughs> right. in Houston at an atheist <laughs> convention, and um, and made a lot of great friends. Instantly made some some friends that I am a, I'm extremely extremely close to still today um, met him the very first day that I was there and um, and so you know I, I obviously I was a big fan of Dawkins by you know already by then and my son and I took a great picture with him there's a lot of history behind that photo we moved the chairs out of the way and the chairs Whenever you, if you Google uh, Dawkins and Hitchens, um, at some point you'll see. It's obvious that it's uh, you know at the at the very end of Hitchens' yes. life, he, he he's emaciated, right, right, just almost immediately after, or a few months later maybe. Um, but it was it was one of his, if not his very last public appearance. He was there receiving the the Dawkins Award. Mm-hmm. And um, but we, you know, we moved the chairs out of the way that they had just been sitting in to, you know, to, for this photo shoot. Uh, so it's the same room, same space, same same everything. And there was a lot of, you know, things that um, that I feel connected with now um, because of how important, you know, all, all of that was at that time for the movement. And so um 
when, when we took that photo, it was very, very meaningful for, for Paul and I. And, and I came home and I posted on Facebook. I had like 200 friends on Facebook. And I did it because I – and I didn't even at that time put Dawkins' name to it or anything. I just posted the photo. And lo and behold, my grandmother's first cousin, who I was raised to call Aunt Grace, who at that time was 84 years old on Facebook, of course, (laughs) typing in all caps, you know, as you are supposed to once you become 80, um, she figured it out. She just she figured it out. I think it was a combination of the photo and now me making friends with people from, you know, from from the, you know, from the Free Thought Convention. Yeah. And and she started, you know, basically threatening me on God's behalf on Facebook. And then, of course, started the fateful and dreadful prayer chain, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> one portion let's try to keep Jerry from going to hell and three portions. Hey, have you heard what the hell's going on with Jerry? (laughs) You know, so so it was the gossip gossip mill, you know? Yeah. So she just went and told everyone. I mean, she didn't bother confirming with you. She just went and said, Jerry's and leaving the faith and we need to help him. And yes, yes, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. So could, could you have denied it? Yes, I absolutely could have wormed my way out of it. Okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, I could have. I, <laughs> but I you chose not I to. Yeah, I. It was. It was. It was just too late for me at that okay. point okay. to have done anything else. I, I would not have been able to live with myself. Um, yeah. I had already touched, um, I had already put a toe, <laughs> you know, in that ocean of freedom. Of freedom, yes. <laughs> and <laughs> and that's and, and knew that's what I was longing for, and I just, there was no backing up at that point. Okay, wow. Yeah. So yeah, what did it cool. kind of feel like coming out not in your own terms, right? Like, so you had to... Uh, you had to scramble. Just scramble, I, yeah. All the, yeah, you know. scrambled. And 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 I'll be honest with you, I feel like I've been scrambling ever since. You know, um, how a relationship starts, you know, has a whole lot to do with how it continues and how it even ends. Yeah, right. And I um, I felt like I came into the secular movement scrambling, and I feel like I'm I'm still in some way scrambling today. Well, you said in the picture your son was with you, so he yes. he he was aware. He knew. Oh yes, absolutely. He now, had what began. Are... Yeah, he had begun to express his, you know, um, lack of favor for okay. for for religion. Um, okay. Two years, two years before I did. Okay, so you had you had an, an ally, with, at did. least one ally. Now, I what did. about your wife? Um, so she she never really was uh, overly religious. You know, she gave it a hard try at different times okay. because that's what we were doing. Right. You know, but she never was a real strong believer, for a lack of other terms. Um, and so she she didn't have an issue with my lack of belief. Now, um, her issue, and and the only reason I'm repeating all of this is because it's it's in the book. There's you know, yeah. uh, I try to I try to maintain a stricter level of privacy for her now than I ever have. Um, but so that she's not given a bad rap in any right. way. Um, she she had not wanted to have the public life that the ministry created in the first place. Right. Uh, right. Then I laid an extra layer of, of um, public life. Of public life yeah. through well through through politics, yeah. through working for you know city hall and then working for the mayor's right. office, um, and so this was much more public and much worse because now in, instead of um, instead of being someone that everyone wanted to be, I was someone that everyone pitied, uh, and so. Wow. It was uh, it was a it was it was horrible. It was absolutely horrible, and and in some ways, possibly harder on her than anyone because she never did want the public attention. Hmm. Right, right. In a way, it was she was having to she was feeling the effects of the choices that you had made. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, a- a- absolutely. That she, you know, she she very emphatically declared, you know, that uh, the price that was being paid was was you know not from choices that she had made. 
So, so what do you do now? You're an atheist. You're in DeRitter, Louisiana. You were a pastor of these churches. Yeah. High, I guess, high in society in DeRitter. Yeah, in that little, yeah, big and fish in a little pond. Big I think. fish in a little pond, and yeah. and now, what, what's what's step one? What do you yeah. what do you go from there? Well, um, like like we've already said, you know, uh, there's a lot of scrambling trying to figure things out, and um, Dr. Delray reached out to me and uh, offered me the executive director's position for recovering from religion. It was a you know unpaid volunteer position at that time. <laughs> There's a lot of those positions out there uh, as a college There's grad. A lot let me tell you that. those positions. Yeah, there is. This is a, even more so in the secular movement than than probably anywhere I've ever encountered. But um, it's very convenient that we we attach uh, giving money to offerings and paying people to ministry. <laughs> That's often <laughs> convenient for for people who may not want to share their money. Um, it was um, it was a very flattering uh, offer, and so I took him up on it. And, and what is recovering from religion? Yeah, so recovering from religion. It, it, to give the briefest definition, because I've been I've been away from it for a few years now, and I don't want to characterize it in a way that it may have evolved, you know, onward right. and upward from from what I had at the time. But Dr. Del Rey wrote a brilliant book, The God Virus, okay. and and it's a it's a fantastic description of, in particular, what happens uh, in the believer's mind whenever uh, you engage them about you know some part of their belief system. Uh, so the God virus becomes active. It's fantastic. It's really, really good. It was so good that that uh, as it began to circulate, people began to reach out to him and say, "Hey, you know, we need help on this subject. You know, what can we do? We're we're recovering religionist. You know, <laughs> what can we do with this?" And so he founded Recovering from Religion, um, and. And that became uh, generally small but local groups um, that kind of f- filled a niche that at the time um, many of the atheist groups, such as like a Freedom from Religion Foundation group or an American atheist group, um, might not have been able to feel it was it was more tolerant of people in transition people still finding their way out of religion you know to whereas you can get into a more um graduated version of a of a secular group and certain questions just will not be tolerated you know at all right right, right. Yeah. <laughs> language understand will not be tolerated. Yeah. now i do think i do think many of them have have kind of for a lack of better words seen the light and and probably practice a greater level of of tolerance uh for their new members uh and for people who are in transition but at the time that was a uh, that was just a a niche that definitely needed to be filled, and so so they did. That was recovering from religion, and and it was growing and needed some leadership. And quite honestly, um, Dr. Delray at the time really thought that if I would get out there, beat the bushes, that we would begin to receive some uh, financial contributions, some financial support, which in turn could lead to a salary for me. Yeah. As executive director, and so so ultimately that was that was what you know I was looking for was how can I save you know save my family how can I save our finances what can I do so that's that gets to an interesting point which is that I, I think the reason that uh, you know people tie the church is they have a community that they're a part of and they want to sustain it and everyone kind of well, recognizes it, those the, cost money the Bible um, also tells them that they have to well. True, but you don't have to. It's interpreted as it's to interpreted tell them that way. That. But yeah, it's, it doesn't really tell them that. But yeah. it's interpreted as to tell them that. Tell way. that to the Mormons. <laughs> oh, I know. Tell that to everybody, but you know, me and four other people. You know. <laughs> I mean, I grew up in a very poor evangelical tradition, and so that wasn't really uh, exactly required because people didn't have the money. But the what I'm trying to get at is that people really do want to be part of communities, and I, th- I think Jerry's been working on that, right? You've been trying to figure out how to build community in groups that aren't just religious. And I think that's a, I think that's a something that uh, everybody needs, right? I think people want to be part of something and it's really nice, you know, to go into a church, for example, 
And, you know, I've been to many, many churches. One of, one of the most interesting churches I ever went to was a, a gay church in uh, Dallas. And, you know, at the time I was not, you know, I, I was of the, you know, gay being gay is a choice. And I went with a friend of mine and it was fascinating. It was like, that was one of those life changing moments for me was to go into that church and just see, you know, couples who were same sex. And that was basically the only difference. And they right. played, they played will and grace in between every sermon. So that was kind of interesting too. <laughs> oh my God, me? I That's would go fantastic. to that church. <laughs> However, I've not awesome. been to church in years, but, but I would go to this church. <laughs> but the point was that this was a community, right? And it was a community that met in a very beautiful church, which obviously cost a lot of money to upkeep. And and what I think I'm trying to get back to here is that people do like to belong, and they like to go in, and they like to. Uh, learn about morality, right? They, they like yes. to have these uh, lessons. You know, I, th I think right. there's something to that. And we all look for it in different ways. There is something to that. And, and if you're, you know, if you're gently asking me, what's the problem? Why, <laughs> you know, why we struggle to do that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Or, or what our obstacle is. Well, the, it, the as I, once again, referencing having worked at the city hall, once upon a time there, my, my boss, the public direct uh, public works director was a retired Lieutenant Colonel. And as he would say, every problem is a leadership problem. And, and, and I think that is particularly true for um, communities in the secular world. And the reason I think it's a leadership problem is because like attracts like. Mm -hmm. um, that's, just, that's just so mm -hmm. natural and obvious, you know, like attracts like. And so in, say, even, even in this gay church, you know, that, that you went to, this Christian, you know, yeah. Christian version, or gay version <laughs> and, uh, of the Christian church. I was holding on yeah. to my girlfriend at the time a little bit tight, just like, no, I'm, like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, right. but yeah. you know, yeah. it became pretty, yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm hooked up, but you know, we went with our friend who was a, a lesbian and, and it was, it was actually a really amazing experience, right? It was, uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, it, 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 I, what it, it, you're being funny and it makes me think of, of, of just in the last few days, um, I've been, I've, I've been posting, um, little quips and being somewhat facetious about dating I'm, I'm i'm back in the dating world now and um and so uh i'm i'm getting hit on by a lot of guys you know oh, wow. and so, so somebody somebody made a point about it you know like poor jerry just started dating again and you know nobody but guys are hitting on him you know and, and i was very serious when i said all all affection and attention is appreciated <laughs> <You know? laughs> You know, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not going to say yes to any of the offers for dinner, you know, from any right. of the handsome guys that are out there, but it's still appreciated. It's yeah. still very much appreciated. Yeah. yeah at, at this uh, point, like, you know, it's just flattering, you know, not interesting, yeah, I, but it's flattering. Right. 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 <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so, um, but when you go into, even if it's, a, you know, a gay Christian church, there is a culture there. Um, that is, I've been talking to different, to different group leaders about this just in the last few days. So it just keeps coming up. Um, we're very afraid in the secular movement to get engaged in the cult of personality. And, and I get that. I, mm -hmm. I, I understand where that comes from. Aren't, uh, and, and aren't we all like our own little cult of personality? So, so like the yeah, we are. We all, all live in our own little cult of personality. Um, but the the if I was going to generalize about this fear as as I perceive it, it is if we got so enamored, so hung up on one particular leader because of their charisma, their style, or whatever, that we we lose sight of our values. We lose sight of um, such as like reason, you know, being being mm -hmm. our chief value. That they're able to lead us astray you know mm, because okay, the, the, okay. the thought is is that in the church world um one of the um one of the thought forming um uh influences is the power of the minister's presentation you know of how they carry themselves that that it is a cult of personality people people are believing whatever this guy says just because he's so just awesome because, right it. okay okay yeah and i'm not saying that that doesn't play a role but i think we can go too far with it so the the way to the way to still be successful in the secular movement in building community 
while we're guarding ourselves against the cult of personality so incredibly hard, uh, and, I, and I'll give you a brief example in a moment of, of, of why doing it the way that people are trying to do it doesn't work, um, we need to understand that cults are very effective, <laughs> and, yeah. they're, and they're not always bad. You know, um, we the language is bad, but um, and the word has you know a negative you know very negative meaning to it. Right? Yeah. Very negative connotation. But 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 the effect that a cult can have is is about the only thing that makes anything work. You know, it's about the only time that anything gets done. And so the way that you do this is you have a a, a cult of a culture. The culture is the cult, and it is the values within that culture that are held at a cultish level. It's the values that you stand for um, and what your mission is that you're attempting to, you know, to fulfill that you hold at a cultish level. When you do that, then um, it's much easier to build community because like attracts like. So now at the leadership level, you have someone that completely congruently reflects this mission and these values hopefully in an attractive way, and everyone who is attracted to to that leader or to that particular organization, they come in ready to do some really neat things like share their money. Yeah, and <laughs> money volunteer. makes money gets things <laughs> right, to happen. Right, right. And volunteers, yeah. You know, yeah, the, there really is something to that that if you Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so if you if you do instead what we've done where the secular movement is like an inflated um, uh, lecture at a university, mm-hmm. the, you know, that, that's what we've got, where you've got the professor, and of course I love all the professors, Dawkins in particular, I'm not, that, that's, I'm not against any of that, not by any means, he saved my life, so I'd never, I'd never you know, be negative in that direction, but when the leader is a person who very um, plainly says they don't need community, <laughs> Yeah, that, that the need for community is what makes these church people be involved in stupid things, then it attracts, like attracts like, and so now you have people coming in who are, they don't need community, they don't accept community as being that important of a value, well, how do you get those people to share money? How do you get those people to volunteer? Those people, they're wanting to do exactly what they're doing. They're wanting to show up five minutes before the lecture starts, <laughs> yeah. sit through the lecture, and learn be something done. new, feel smarter when they leave. That's it. Yeah. Go home, drink a craft beer, right? So That's right. And and call, you know, and, yeah. and talk to their friends about how smart they are because they went to the lecture. <laughs> right. And, right. And, and this right. gets right. to this very famous West Wing moment, I think, right, in the show The West Wing. And this, uh, he says, you know, if liberals are so damn smart, how come they always lose? And, you know, it's not <laughs> to just point this to secularism, but I think I think just yeah. in general, the left, uh, which, which is not all secular, obviously, you know, I think Christian tradition is very left-leaning. But a lot of times, yeah, we don't put in the money that is required to sustain movements, right? You need people to organize. And as you have said many times through this whole interview, is that, um, you know, people are busy. You just, you don't have time to do these things. And so if you're not paid to do them, they're going to fall through unless you have some incredibly dedicated volunteers. And that that's ex- that's exactly right, and 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 just real quick to hit on that. Forgive me for interrupting no, you, please. but I, I just I just had a very um, anyway. original thought, and I, I don't want to lose it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, groupthink is a problem, um, and we really fight against groupthink. But the one thing that groupthink has on its side is groups. Yeah, that's right. I, I 100% agree with that. <laughs> and, and so we've just got think yeah, tank. <laughs> we're, we're all, you know, unique little uh, beautiful snowflakes and we all have our own path that if everyone would follow us would go well. But, you know, that, right. that doesn't really get you anywhere. And, that's right. you, you know, you need to be part of something. And, you know, uh, that's why, you know, Holly and I have been part of PORP and we're trying to grow that movement. You know, we think that there's something there and there were some really great victories tonight. 
uh, that are aligned with, you know, my personal political beliefs. And I think there's going to be sure. more. Sure. You know, and so. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I absolutely agree. <laughs> and, it's and, it's and a Tuesday a, night, by the way, just in case anyone's listening to the yeah, podcast Tuesday, later. It's the, the night of the, the Virginia and New Jersey governor elections. Right. So. Yeah. And yeah. you know what's what's interesting about that is we will give we will give personalities the cult of personality a little bit of a pass in politics because Absolutely. we want we want that we want that absolutely yeah. want that. <laughs> and, I'll admit and we, that about Obama like, I liked Obama yeah, a lot but I gave him a pass yeah. on a lot of stuff <laughs> absolutely that's and we exactly see that with right. Trump and his supporters that's yeah right. yeah that's, that's, you, that's, you that's have right. a charismatic leader who says everything you want to hear <laughs> in a way that you find in a way you like to hear <laughs> that's right in a way you like to hear I mean I'll never forget the first time that I saw the black and white uh, steel of President Obama where his collar is turned up it's a it's mm-hmm. It's a mm-hmm. profile view, and his collar's turned up, and it's reminiscent. It's it's a it's a throwback to Elvis. Oh, a little bit, you know, with his collar turned up that way. And I was like, oh yeah, man, that's hot. I like that. <laughs> yeah. I like that a lot because I'm a huge like Elvis the, fan. The yeah. one where like, he's got glasses, and it's kind of the Matrix look. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that exactly. one. That's there, right. there was that's one right. where he was uh, dunking a basketball, I think, right, or something like that. That's pretty <laughs> right. awesome. You're like, damn, yeah. this this guy. <laughs> this, this guy. This guy. Look, check his guy out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. But if I, I could backtrack our- a little bit, Jerry, you said something interesting. You said Richard Dawkins saved your life. Can you elaborate on that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, now hold that point real quick, and let me just say, a lot of people, before we leave this subject entirely – to avoid the cult of personality, a lot of organizations are 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 having someone different speak every time that they open the doors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Bad idea, horrible idea. For anybody out there listening, stop doing that. Find your best speaker. Use them continuously because that's the reason why yeah, you have such turnover back. in attendance. Somebody shows up. They like the guy who was leading it and was speaking. They show up the next week. It's somebody else who stumbles around, staggers through what they're doing, and those people don't show back up the next time. So anyway. Um, okay. Yeah, go go for your best speakers. Use them. Everybody else can figure out something else to do. There's plenty for everybody to do. But anyway, so yeah, so the reason I say that Dawkins saved my life, and it's not him by himself. With just you know, I was I was kind of you know throwing some shade on professors there for a second. Um, <laughs> but it, but it's a combination of Dawkins and Daniel Dennett and Dan Barker and Linda Lascola. Um, you know, Linda. Oh my gosh! If you if you've never interviewed Linda, get Linda on here. Linda. Okay. Linda, that's 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 my uh, boy. She would she her skin's about to crawl, and she's not going to know why. Linda is my <laughs> spiritual mother. <laughs> Linda Lascola is really the person um, who who came up with the idea of let's look into this phenomenon of ministers who don't believe. You know, she was reading, she was reading Daniel Dennett's book. And while she was reading um, one of his books, I don't remember which one it was. It may have been Breaking the Spell. I don't know which, um, you know, philosopher Daniel Dennett. Um, she just, it just came to her that this is something that needs to be looked into, something needs to be dealt with. And so uh, she became the researcher, and her and Daniel did uh, a study where they interviewed several closeted members uh, of the ministry that did not believe. And, and this study um, turns into a conversation between Richard Dawkins and uh, Daniel Dennett and, of course, Linda Lascola, and and they bring into this conversation Dan Barker because Dan Barker was the guy who was able to supply the names of these ministers because ministers were, you know, who were closeted were reaching out to him because thanks to the Internet and books that Dan had published – if you were looking for someone who represented preachers who no longer believe, Dan Barker was the living testament of that. And so he knew people. He, he, he could put Linda and Daniel Dennett in contact with these people. And so this creates a conversation between all the names that I've already listed twice. And Dawkins says we need to do something for these people. You know, what can we do for these people? 
And so it was the Dawkins Foundation that put uh, up the money originally to create a website um, that would become a message board, a private and anonymous message board that qualified people could log into and communicate with, you know, where closeted member ministers could communicate with other non-believing closeted ministers and also communicate with people who had already come out and had left the ministry to seek support and, um, you know, and some type of advice and insight. And so that's that's where I came in. That's 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 the piece that belongs to me. That's the clergy project. That's the clergy project. And so if if there are other people like you listening, where can they go to find the clergy project? Uh, I believe it is still. Let's see. Is it? I think it's the clergy uh, clergyproject dot org. I believe. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, we yeah. we checked on it. So yeah, it's clergyproject dot org. So yeah, if I wasn't sure if it was net or org. So yeah, yeah, the clergyproject dot org. And if they go there, then they're going to find an opportunity to uh, submit an application. Uh, they will eventually be screened uh, because the only people who are able to participate in the clergy project are people who have already crossed a threshold and know that they no longer believe. Um, there's no intentions by anyone involved in the clergy project to deconvert anyone okay. or to lead anyone through a deconversion. You have to prove that you are a minister or that you were a minister um, and that you no longer believe. And that's through a series of, of, of conversations, of screenings. That, but it uh, is a non- Anonymous, right? So if you yes. want to remain anonymous, it is anonymous. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it will not be anonymous to the person who is screening you um, okay. because they're going to need to hear enough of your story and verify enough of your story that a person cannot get into the network that would do any kind of damage. You okay. know, uh, right, right, right. But but then once you're in in the forum, um, it is as anonymous as you want it to be. You know, everyone okay. is encouraged uh, to not use their names, to not give any personal information uh, to anyone until they make some real friendships, some you know, with someone. And even then, it's obviously not required. Okay. And where can we find you, Jerry? Yeah, so I'm easy to track down if you just go to jerrydewitt.net. Um, don't be thrown off. It'll take you to our Patreon page, but we're slowly <laughs> learning how to put everything <laughs> onto our Onto our Patreon Please page. Tithe. Yes, it'll feel yeah. <laughs> yeah. good. You'll feel good. Ten percent. Yeah. Yeah. The majority of everything on there is going to be for free. It is just yeah. links back to a Facebook page or a Twitter page or, or, or whatever else. Um, but that it was either it was either link jurydewitt.net to uh, the Patreon page that already existed, or for Jerry Dewitt to figure out how to set down and .net another website after the Hope After Faith Publishers website expired. <laughs> so I was like, no, nah, I'm just, I'm not in the mood to do all that yet. And you are on Twitter? Yes. Right. Yes. I think At, it's Jerry underscore DeWitt, I think. Yes. I don't I don't remember any of these things. It's horrible. I think, I think you're right. Jerry yeah. underscore DeWitt. I'm on Instagram, you know, <laughs> I'm on Twitter, I'm on Google Plus, I'm on you Snapchat, know, you name it. No Yeah, actually I do have Snapchat. You do have Snapchat, <laughs> Jerry. <laughs> yeah. Man, you are far often. more ahead than I am. You know, but I no but kidding. I do use it. It's hard for me to figure out what should go where. Yeah. You know? I, that. I gave up on trick. Snapchat. Yeah, yeah, but I do, I do have Snapchat. Um, uh, yeah, so yeah. yeah, there's okay. even yeah, there's other things too, but they're probably not nearly as fun or as important. Thank you so much, Jerry, and thank you for listening to Politics Within Reason, which is produced by the Party of Reason and Progress, a 527 political organization. Hey, Nation! Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to give us a like, share, or a comment. If you like what Corp is doing and what you hear, why not consider becoming a supporting member? Help us do more. Join today at partyofreasonandprogress.org. The Party of Reason and Progress is a registered IRS 527 organization. Contributions made to Corp or other IRS 527 organizations are not tax deductible. Politics Within Reason is the official podcast of the Party of Reason and Progress. <laughs>